So one of the things we've learned in the United States is that capitalism brings different people together within our country. It's part of why I've been on a crusade against the politicization of capital markets through the rise of ESG and the stakeholder capitalism movement in America. Tocqueville famously said when he traveled this country that a diverse, divided body politic that's a democracy like America, it's not supposed to stand. It's supposed to crumble under the weight of its own division unless there's something greater that binds us together across that diversity. And capitalism provided us one of those spaces for us to come together, whether we're black or white, whether we're Democrat or Republican for that matter. It was one of these apolitical sanctuaries that allowed people across the divides of partisanship to come together. And that's why I think it's such a danger for that capital market and for that private sector to become politicized. But that philosophy, I think, works within the United States, binding us together amongst diverse attributes as one people. I think one of the areas where we did take that philosophy with the best of intentions in the wrong direction was on the international stage, believing that we could apply that same principle of using capitalism as a vehicle to sow over international divisions, particularly those between the US and China. And I think in retrospect, now if we look back at the experiment we began 50 years ago in this country of using capitalism not as a vehicle to bind Americans together within a common nation, but instead to potentially bind together China and America, I think we would look and see a very different version of that same story, a perversion of that vision that Tocqueville had in mind, where 50 years ago, we thought we could export Big Macs and Happy Meals and somehow spread democracy to places like China, when in fact, what they realized is that they could use capitalism, or at least I should say capitalism in air quotes, as a vehicle to advance their agenda instead. That is a complicated story. There are few people who understand it deeply, who understand the history of where we might have erred, and most importantly, what we can learn from it to get our way out of a bilateral relationship we've entered with China that has proven far more dangerous than we imagine. And I'm joined today on the podcast by one of the people who I think understands this more deeply than most. Uh, my I would say friend from afar, but today someone who I'm, I'm actually having a deeper conversation with for the first time, Monica Crowley. And I wanted to say, Monica, welcome to the podcast. And I've really been looking forward to this conversation and I'm glad we're able to do it. Me too. Thank you so much for having me. It is my honor and pleasure to join you here today. So I thought it'd be useful, you know, your, your history goes further back than the Trump administration, where I know you served in the treasury department, but I thought it would be useful just briefly to lay out a bit of your history, particularly your career in government, and particularly you know the front row seat you had to watching our economic policy towards China evolve over the years. And then we'll get into that discussion that I just teed up. Well, thank you so much for this opportunity, Vivek. And by the way, I am so grateful for your entry into this presidential race. It, your contribution is just extraordinary. You're raising really critical issues and you're doing it in thoughtful, in-depth ways that are is, is causing a lot of people to pay closer attention to issues like ESG and DEI. You've done that for a long time, but now with the platform of running for president, you're providing an invaluable service in elevating the overall conversation and directing a lot of people's attention to the issues that need attention. So big gratitude and big props to you for doing that, Vivek. Thank you. I appreciate that, Monica. Yeah, and I also want to thank you for allowing me the opportunity to talk about China, because as you probably know, my very first job out of college was working for former President Richard Nixon. And uh, Vivek, I'd I like to, uh, to joke that I've worked now for former President Richard Nixon in his last years and President Trump at the Treasury Department. And man, do I know how to pick him or what? <laughs> well, only the most controversial presidents for Monica, okay? No Grover Cleveland's for me. Um, I will say that my experience with President Nixon in the early to mid 1990s before he passed away was extraordinary because I learned about China from the really one of the masters of the 20th century in American foreign policy, and certainly the man who opened the door to China in 1972. 
Richard Nixon actually began thinking seriously about how to reorient American foreign policy toward China in the mid-1960s when he saw, Vivek, that the geopolitical dynamics were changing at the time. And what he saw in real terms was that the Soviet Union at the time was gaining tremendous power in real terms, in, in terms of military hardware, in terms of their nuclear arsenal, modernizing their nuclear arsenal. And of course, then at the time we had the war in Vietnam, which was escalating. So Nixon was watching all of this play out. And by the time he was ready to run for president in 1967, he wrote a very famous piece in Foreign Affairs uh, about perhaps we might reconsider our approach to China and rethink our isolation of the world's most populous nation and consider bringing China into what he called the community of nations. So he wrote that piece in 1967. He becomes president in January of 1969. And what he decided to do was open the door to China. And again, at the time, it was strictly a geostrategic and geopolitical calculation, nothing to do with the economics at the time. He saw that there was uh, that the Soviet Union was engaged in a tremendous military buildup, and he wanted to counterbalance growing, growing Russian power. And he felt that by opening the door to China and thawing those relations, that we could counterbalance growing Soviet power on the one hand, that was the overriding reason, but also to try to enlist the Chinese to an end to the war in Vietnam and a whole host of other geostrategic issues. As time went on, Vivek, that, that approach to China began to morph into something else because the Chinese over time, as you pointed out, began to adopt reform, economic reform, not political reform, but economic reform. And actually what the Chinese did, which was so much smarter than what the Russians did, the Russians in the late 80s, early 90s under Gorbachev began with political reform first. They had glasnost and perestroika, political reform and economic reform, but they did the political reform first, and of course, that collapsed the entire system. The Chinese approached it in a much more systematic and responsible way in their eyes, which is, we're going to do the economic reform, and, and that is going to be the way to stave off any kind of pressure or demand for political reform. Mm. And that's how the Chinese communists have stayed in power all these years where the Russian communists are long gone, at least in, in word. Monica, I've got so many, so many questions. I mean, so much there that was so useful, actually, just to sort of, I mean, that was in a short amount of time, <laughs> actually uh, packed a bigger punch than I was uh, expecting to gulp on that first breath. So this is, this is very useful. So what was Nixon doing in 1967 when he wrote that paper? So Nixon had lost the election in 1960 to John F. Kennedy. Right. And then he won in 1962 for governor of California and lost that race too. So he spent the subsequent years of practicing law in New York City and thinking about the world because he knew he wanted to come back in 1968. So that piece that he wrote for Foreign Affairs in 67 was really the first shot across the bow that he was going to run again. Because the because the narrative and and I'm I'm a you know generation you know younger than this I wasn't you know born at the time but the way we're taught this is you know really like Kissinger led this and sort of Nixon was just sort of brought along for the ride I, the idea that Nixon had this forethought and was writing about this during his down years but in preparing that's just an interesting um, frankly I mean it makes me respect Nixon more <laughs> just hearing that in terms of understanding the kind of forethought that he had that I think conveys an intentionality that sometimes you miss about the man as he's remembered. That's just biographically interesting. Uh, would you say that's a fair characterization? 
Yes, absolutely. And, you know, Richard Nixon was a brilliant foreign policy mind. He did detente with the Soviet Union in order to buy time while our resources were really drained and constrained by the war in Vietnam. He could not approach the Soviet Union in the kind of aggressive way that he wanted to, that we later saw under President Reagan. So we bought time while the United States could regroup and heal and get our economy back and our military back together after the war in Vietnam. So Ronald Reagan was impossible without it, Richard Nixon. He did that, shuttle diplomacy in the Middle East, the opening to China, um, sort of the restructuring of NATO. He was giving uh, real thought to that as well. So obviously a brilliant and visionary foreign policy mind. And, and, you know, when you said we're talking about reopening relations, I guess 1972 is the big year to think about there, right? With respect to his trip to China. Is that about right? Yes. Uh, So- so I think that, that, I mean, maybe this is obvious and I, I should have you know known this, but again, the way I look at this in retrospect was more about the U.S. relationship with China, but you appropriately cast it actually as just a side note in the broader power struggle or power balance with the Soviet Union. That's actually also just really interesting context that it was less thinking about China itself becoming the behemoth that we would otherwise have a competitive relationship with, but more as a smaller player on the chessboard vis-a-vis the Soviet Union. Is that a fair characterization, if I'm to understand the way you described that correctly? Yes, yes, absolutely. And certainly that was the dynamic at the time. Uh, China was always sort of the junior communist partner to the Soviet Union, and they had a real ideological rivalry. You had the Sino-Soviet split in 1950. We've spent all decades, decades, presidents of every uh, party trying to keep the Soviet Union and then later Russia and China apart. And of course, Joe Biden has driven them into each other's arms, which we could talk about. This is a geopolitical catastrophe. But I want to make one other quick point here, because over time, Vivek, the relationship that started with China strictly on a geopolitical basis, then evolved into an economic basis. And now it's a mixture of diplomatic, military, um, uh, cultural, all kinds of uh, competitions on all fronts. That was not something that Richard Nixon foresaw. But Mm. I will say this, there is this theory that democracies tend not to fight one another. And so the opening to China over time evolved into this theory that if we can open China to the world economically, and if the Chinese people will have an economic choice in their lives, go into a store and have their pick of 10 brands of toothpaste like we have in the capitalist world, that 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 awareness of economic choice will lead to pressure and a demand for political choice in China. We have seen that that has not played out. The Chinese communists have played a much more sophisticated long game than we ever anticipated. And so now we're in this position where we are facing what the Chinese call unrestricted warfare in every single dimension of competition. And Nixon was nothing if not adaptable, Vivek. So he would be right there on the front lines saying that the CCP is our Mere adversary, and we need to confront them aggressively. And, and would you say that that was something that, if you're thinking about Mao uh, back then, I guess Mao was the was the you know counterpart who was playing this game on the other side. Do you think that this was the product of forethought on his part? Like, do you do you give Mao that credit for being a visionary in that sense to say that I know they see me this way? And they think I'm going to reform economically when, in fact, that just gets me to be in more of a peer status, even when I'm not. And they think that's going to make me reform politically. But boy, you bet we're not like, do, do you, I mean, that's how it's played out. So he was a genius if he did. Do, do you think this was the product of forethought? Uh, Well, not at the time. I mean, I I don't know 100% for sure. And it's a really interesting historical question, Vivek. Um, Mao was in his last years at the time. So it was mostly the Chinese premier, Zhou Enlai, who did the negotiations with Nixon and Kissinger for the opening. I think their primary calculation at the time was geopolitical as well, because of growing Soviet power right on their border, including nuclear weapons. I think the Chinese thought, look, 
for the time being, we are incredibly weak. And so we need to bandwagon with a more um, a powerful force in the world. So we are no longer going to be sort of at odds with the Soviet Union alone. We're going to join, um, at least in some sense, with the United States um, for protection. So this is like, you know, international relations one on one on one on one, where weaker powers tend to bandwagon with stronger powers for protection. I think that was what was going on at the time. Now, if you fast forward to the late 1970s, now you're talking about Deng Xiaoping. And Deng Xiaoping was the one who succeeded Mao, and he is the one who began economic reforms. And while we were all cheering that in the West because we wanted to see economic reforms lead to political reforms and the end of the CCP, I think to your question, Deng Xiaoping was the one who began with agriculture, reform in agriculture, and then bumped it up to an industrial revolution in China. I think he is the one who foresaw a longer game in terms of bringing the Chinese co uh, economy to par with the West. And that was competition I think he saw way ahead of his time. Got it. So you give the forethought, malice of forethought or just forethought, period of genius of forethought, uh, however you want to describe it, more to Deng Xiaoping than to, than to either Mao or, or Lai. Okay. Um, interesting. Interesting. And so who was, when, let's, let's track the history of when Deng, when did Deng Xiaoping take over? I believe it was mid 1970s, and he began the economic reforms, starting with the agra agrarian agricultural reforms in the late 70s. So 1977, 1978. So we're talking Ford here in the U.S., um, sort of under Ford, and then kind of Jimmy Carter. Okay, excuse me, Jimmy Carter, right. and then uh, Carter into Reagan. Right. That, that's right. But you know, the whole philosophy on both parties here in the U.S. was, OK, China is still a backwater and it's great that they're doing all of these economic reforms and maybe eventually, you know, they'll 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 succeed in getting China back on on their feet. But while we were busy focusing on the end of, of the Cold War and getting the Soviet Union to their knees, China was busy reforming and doing something really important, Vivek, which is creating a middle class. Because right. what we know throughout history is that middle class, when you develop a middle class in any society, it is a stabilizing force. And so the CCP brilliantly, through these economic reforms, generated a stabilizing middle class. And if people are relatively prosperous, they have a roof over their head, they, they're not starving, they have food to eat, they're not going to revolt. And so the CCP's calculation over the last 40 to 50 years has been ingenious. So Deng Xiaoping, was he in charge for about 10 years then? I believe so. Yeah, well, under under Mao, under Mao, he was the Chinese premier. Right, right, right. So, so in retrospect, I guess if we were to have learned this lesson differently, right? This we we were worried about the Soviet Union. Now Mao began and we began both with respect to a negotiation in the shadow of the Soviet Union as well. But when Deng Xiaoping started to take this in a different direction, I guess it's hard to, if I'm to put myself in the position of. Uh, Carter or a Reagan, for that matter, this isn't, this isn't so much a partisan issue. It's hard not to believe that that was just a good thing that was happening, right? There's economic reform, there were trading, there's a more modern thinking leader. I'm just less, the goal is less to find fault and to more quickly get to where we are today and find our path forward. But even just retrospectively, if we're to look in the mirror and look through the long arc of the history that got us into this challenging, codependent relationship that we're now in with China, and we trace the path of how we got here. At least back then, I think it would be hard to say that any of us, had we been in the same shoes, would have behaved any differently. What do you think? When Nixon opened the door to China, it was basically enlisting China as not a formal ally, but at least sidelining them as any kind of adversary. 
Because right. remember, in the context of the war in Vietnam, we had we, our resources were completely drained. So there was no way we could fight a two front war against the Soviet Union and against China. So Nixon brilliantly at the time opened the door to China to sort of neutralize any potential conflict with China at the time. Um, and, you know, this idea that, well, eventually they would come along. The other thing, too, is over the last 50 years since Nixon opened uh, with China, Vivek, is that we've always had bigger, more immediate and more urgent enemies to deal with. Right. So we took our eye off of China to undermine and ultimately collapse the Soviet Union and the Eastern Bloc, the Warsaw Pact. And that was a hugely historic moment. Major, major. And then over time, we had all these other enemies rise up with the collapse of the Soviet Union and that bipolar uh, structure in the world. So then we had the rise of Islamic fundamentalism and Al Qaeda and then ISIS. So we always seem to have more urgent and immediate adversaries that we had to think about and deal with. And so I was off the ball on China. And while that was happening, the Chinese very cleverly stayed under the radar. They weren't particularly provocative, but they were building up their military and they were building up their economy to the point where um, they, they also had the luxury of developing other strategies like elite capture, which also we weren't paying attention to in the West, capturing Western elites, the NBA, um, uh, members of Congress, leaders, and so on. That proved to be just as effective a strategy for the CCP as anything that they were doing economically. And now it's almost too late that we have uh, we've noticed that uh, the CCP is a major, major force and an enemy of the United States. Yeah. So let's let's I mean, that's actually an incredibly valuable historical arc that I think allows us to be more forgiving maybe than I have been and even some of my commentary towards the bipartisan consensus around this over the last you know, several decades that got us to where we are. Um, now let's fast forward to where we are, right? We're in this mutually codependent relationship with China, economically codependent. I think if we're to use a human relationships analogy, codependent relationships do not end well. The only question is who ends it first. And and I've long made the case that the sooner we end it, the better for us. And the longer we wait, the continually better it will be for them. And I think that the thing that's wrong with it to me is that China has actually gone one step even further. It wasn't just the failure to make political reforms that we might have preferred them to make in China. It's actually the use of the economic relationship itself to combine with the absence of political reform, to use our economic relationship as a cudgel to advance their political agendas. So how you get to BlackRock or Nike or Airbnb or whatever, applying constraints in the US like an emissions cap or criticism to the US like protesting racial injustice or using user data that Airbnb hands over to the CCP all as a condition for doing business in China because they know that companies and the way capitalism works is it dances to the tune of the highest bidder. And if that's the second highest market, that then becomes a ticket price of entry that gets Western CEOs to jump like circus monkeys to meet their demands, even if their objectives are not purely economic in nature. So, you know, let, let's, less playing the blame game of saying that shouldn't we have predicted this and isn't it someone's fault for having gotten us here? More of what do we do now that we are in this relationship where it would seem that there's real economic sacrifice that we'd have to make to wean ourselves off? I have my views on this, which others have heard from me on. But I want to hear from you. What's your view on given that status quo that we're mired in? What's the right next steps to find our way out? Or should we be finding our way out? Or is the solution something else altogether? Well, I think if we don't find our way out of this codependent relationship where um, China is just seeking absolute economic dominance and frankly, military, diplomatic and cultural dominance around the world. If we don't find our way out of this, Vivek, we are going to be essentially slaves to the CCP. I mean, I really think that President Xi 
views his mission as head of the CCP, president of China, to restore China as the middle kingdom power. Not unlike how Vladimir Putin views his role as restoring as much of the Soviet Union as possible. They view sort of the, the evolution of their own countries into sort of this also ran status compared to the United States and the West as a huge travesty. So you've got President Xi, who is very intelligent, very uh, visionary in his own way, and very ruthless. He wants to restore China as a middle king, the middle kingdom power, where every other nation on earth, or at least most of them, are vassal states in service to the CCP and its interests. And that includes the United States in his mind. So if we don't take action now to decouple the United States as much as we can and our economy from the supply chains and everything else coming from China economically, the labor force, the cheap labor and all of it, then we are going to find ourselves on the back heel pretty fast. Again, the Chinese have had a 50 year running start here before we actually our attention was turned to what they're doing. Now that we're aware, I think all of the things that you laid out in terms of using um, economic levers against the CCP are critical. You know, President Trump got a world of hurt. He, you know, he got all kinds of criticism from free traders because he was using tariffs. Tariffs are a blunt force, but Vivek, like all communists throughout history, the CCP's attention is only grabbed when you use a blunt force object. You've got to get them to the table and you've got to get their attention. And playing a gentleman's economic game is not the way to do it. You need a cudgel and you need the political will to use it if you're going to make any change whatsoever. So the question is whether the tariffs are now what the free traders might have begun as a complaint about tariffs to whether tariffs are enough actually where we are today. And, and, and before I get into some specific policy solutions that I'm weighing, and I'd love to hear yours, what on a philosophical foundation should be our framework for the trade-offs that we should be willing to bear? Because let's accept that part of the steady slide into this codependent relationship was serially one incremental added convenience after another to say that well, on the margin, we would rather get that from China than to make it at home or even to get it from another partner who provided it incrementally more expensively. But geopolitically, that continues to steadily sort of when do when does a pile of grains of sand become a heap? You know, you can't really tell that one more grain of sand would do it. But at a certain point, you you have a heap instead of a bunch of grains of sand. That's where we are in this relationship with China is it didn't start as a codependent relationship, but piece by piece, one day you wake up and it's an absolutely a codependent relationship that now that the dialogue is the other way around in both parties to say that it would be too much of a cost, too much of a sacrifice, that you would tank the U.S. economy if you were to unwind those dependencies. I, I have my views on this, but how do you draw the distinction or the framework for what level of short-run pain we should at least be willing to incur in return for doing what we know to be the right thing over the long run? Well, here I also want to commend you, Vivek, because you are um, a very articulate spokesperson for what needs to be done here, and you've got you've got your eye on a much longer term view, which is what we need. We need political leaders who are, first of all, not compromised or deeply in bed with the CCP like our current commander in chief is and has been along with his family for a very long time. You can't expect any of this conversation to come from Joe Biden. So forget that. But we have a lot of elites um, on both sides of the aisle who have been deeply compromised by the CCP. So to, to sort of rely on our current batch of leaders is going to be a huge mistake. This is another major contribution that you are making to this discussion, Vivek, and we should all be grateful to you for that. Um, we need visionary leaders with a long-term view who also have the political will and the political courage to go to the American people and explain exactly what we're up against with the CCP. I think, you know, we, we've seen some real bipartisan support for taking a more aggressive approach to the CCP. So that exists, 
And then on top of that, you have a lot of the American people who have been directly and negatively impacted by what has happened over the last 40 or 50 years. You know, Trump came out in, 19, in uh, 2015, 2016 and spoke to the forgotten men and women as you do as well. So the ground politically is very fertile for this conversation to, to take place. Yes, we will ask the American people to sacrifice in the short term. And again, this is a, a tough political argument to make given the Biden inflation that everybody is experiencing here, where you're paying $25 for a dozen eggs. But you've got to have leaders like you who are willing to say to the American people, I'm gonna tell you the truth. If we don't take on China now and begin to decouple and do all the things that, that you've articulated, Vivek, and more, but if we don't do this now, you're gonna end up basically being a, a slave state. We're gonna be a slave state to the CCP. We're no longer gonna be number one. Our economic dominance will go away. Our superpower status is gonna go away. What does that mean for you and me? Well, probably higher prices, but we're gonna onshore our manufacturing. We're gonna onshore our pharmaceuticals. We're gonna bring these supply chains back from China to the United States. And you know what? In the meantime, we're gonna explore other areas, but we're gonna remove our production across the board. And you got to go to people like Elon Musk, who is great on the speech issue, but he's deeply in bed with the CCP on Tesla and so on. We've got to make sure that we've got leadership who can articulate this to the American people, but also to our ruling class, Vivek. And here's where you come in. <laughs> you've taken this on and you're doing it so well. You've got everybody's attention but we've got to be making the case to the American people that in the short term, there is going to be pain here. But if we don't do this now, the pain in the long term is going to be far more significant. I, I think it could be existential, actually, for the continuation of the experiment, American experiment as we know it. And, you know, Mike, I got to say, part of firsthand for me was, and I didn't share with you some of my, my background on this is, I actually was an exchange student in China for two years in college. I went to Beida, uh, you know, the Harvard of China when I was kind of in Harvard just for one of the springs. Uh, I, I've gone on to do business in China. Actually, with my biotech career, had a subsidiary that I, you know, that we started in China. It was operated separately, but had been there firsthand, spoken at investment conferences there. I can't travel there now, actually, given how critical I've been. Literally, I, I could not safely travel, like it would be unthinkable for me to travel in China. I'm not sure I would even be allowed to. But I did see firsthand, I think, the way in which they deeply understand the West, I think, better than we in America understand them. And I think there is an intentionality to it. Maybe not when Mao began, but maybe starting under Deng Xiaoping, but definitely under Xi Jinping's watch, an intentionality to this game. As a side note, it's part of the reason why when I founded Strive, first of all, exited China in my biotech business quietly when started to maybe see the writing on the wall where this was going. When I started Strive, which was competing against BlackRock and the likes of State Street and Vanguard, we made a decision to say we would not do business in China, not just because we don't like China or whatever, but because you can't be a good fiduciary to a US client if the boot of the CCP is on your neck when you also have to serve that master as a condition for market entry into China. So I, I think that BlackRock, for example, is to bring your, up your example, like so many business, U.S. businesses compromised by having the boot of the CCP on their neck as a condition for being able to expand into China. I think the right answer from the U.S. perspective has to be some tough medicine here, which is to say, and I, I would go, there's a lot of intermediate steps, but here's a far enough step that I would be willing to go to if necessary, which is to say that we would ban most U.S. businesses from expanding into China unless and until the CCP stops cheating, stops mm -hmm. adopting mercantilist practices in the name of capitalism that have nothing to do with capitalism, but really just political mercantilism. And, and I, you know, I think this, this question of sacrifice then comes up. And I think the two things I would say in response to that, or that I, I do say, even on this campaign trail to places like Iowa and New Hampshire, where even Republican audiences, it's not necessarily a message. That, it's definitely not a message that's universally uh, well received at first it's it's well received but there's there's a reality to it that involves some sacrifice what i say is 
look, you can make a sacrifice if you know what you're sacrificing for, right? And that's this thing we call America. And that's why these questions of American national identity, it's not just about some superficial woke culture war. If you forget your shared sense of American identity itself, you've lost your ability to make that sacrifice. Forget about it because the convenience of how you live tomorrow or an hour from now, you wouldn't change an increment of that if there wasn't a greater value you're sacrificing for, which is why I just think our foreign policy, including with respect to China, is so inextricably linked to our domestic cultural revival and national fortitude. But here's the other thing that I, that, that I I'm, for better or worse, is more persuasive to the audience as I speak to, is that it's precisely when you're most willing to make a sacrifice that you may not have to make one at all. And you know, China isn't a vulnerable spot. I mean, Xi Jinping did what autocrats do last year, holding on to his unprecedented third term, did a lot of damage to the Chinese economy. If we did take that step, yeah, that would cause us some pain, but it would still cause them more in a vulnerable moment, which might be our one of our last windows that we might have to actually extract the kinds of concessions and reforms that we're going to need in order to otherwise be in this downward one-way slide of eventually co-equality, but then submissiveness to China. So I, I know that was a little bit of a long exposition of my view there, but I hope we can have our cake and eat it too, but fortitude is actually the only way. If you're weak about it, you'll never get that. But if you're willing to make that sacrifice because you know what you're sacrificing for, we may not actually have to make nearly as much of a sacrifice as we think if we can extract the major reforms that we do expect from the other side. But that's a gamble. And, I, and I'll admit that. It's, it, nothing is certain in life or in geopolitics. Certainly as the next US president, if I'm elected, that's what I'm willing to do. But I think that that's something the people of this country are going to very honestly not be, uh, you know, let's just say, you know, tricked into or, or sort of coddled into thinking that there's no risk or trade off. There is. But it's just a risk that we're going to have to take. That's the way I look at it, at least. Yeah, everything in life is a trade off anyway. And I think most human beings understand that. And look, Vivek, I think you articulated that so beautifully. We need leadership who is uncompromised and unafraid to make this argument to the American people. And like I said, I think there's fertile ground there because so many Americans have lost their jobs, have had their families shattered, have seen their communities just collapse because of globalism over the past, what, 30, 40 years. And I think so many Americans are open to this conversation and they're willing to say, yeah, you know, I am willing to put up with higher prices. I am willing to put up with some short-term pain in order to save my country and make sure that in the long term, we are not a vassal state to the Chinese Communist Party. I think uh, you know, the American people will respond to that kind of call for sacrifice when it's made based in facts, truth, and vision. Um, you know, our difficulty is that there's been decades of indoctrination. So reaching young people on this who really don't believe that America is worth saving, that's a conversation for a different day. But I think the vast majority of Americans are certainly open to this conversation and want a president and want their leadership to be far more aggressive with China rather than just coddling China and hoping that this is all going to have a good outcome. I can tell you throughout history, you know your history too, anytime you're, the United States is up against a communist power, a totalitarian dictatorship of any kind, it, it's not going to end well. And it usually ends up in a kinetic conflict. The Chinese right now are preparing for a kinetic conflict, first with Taiwan and then with the United States. So we, we better be prepared now for that. And first of all, our leadership isn't and the American people aren't because they haven't been told. But if they're told, I think their eyes will, uh, will open. And to your point on the economic side, that's how you neutralize their diplomatic, cultural and military aggression as well by beginning to cripple their economy. So I want to get to Taiwan in a second. But what, one area where I think that there's sometimes a an ambiguity in the discussion that we can help parse here is make sure we don't conflate declaring independence from China 
with having to immediately believe that that means onshoring all of that to the U.S. Mm-hmm. Right. right, and this goes to the scope of the sacrifice. So one is one is just it's like a poker game or it's like a negotiation or like a business deal. You're willing to make a sacrifice. Well, if the other side has to make a bigger sacrifice, then you won't have to make any at all. Great. There's that version of it. But one is we can reduce the scope of the sacrifice we're talking about too. And and here I think that I think it's important for us as Americans not to conflate the protectionist justifications with the geopolitical justifications and reasons for wanting to decouple from China. And so I think it's a very different picture if we say that everything we're having supplied by China and the market opportunities we access there has to be substituted for entirely by the United States through an onshoring agenda versus saying that the combination of Japan, South Korea, India, Southeast Asia, the Philippines, Australia, Western Europe, much of Western Africa, Brazil, South America can pick up that slack in a more evenly distributed way, which just makes that, you know, I've talked to you know, a number of supply chain experts on this. Maybe you're you know, you, you probably have some expertise yourself in this category, makes that a lot more digestible. Like it's just a very different picture when we think about it that way versus the daunting task of saying, you know, it's always good to man up and say, oh, I'm sure we're going to do it here. And, and you know, I, I, I'd love that. <laughs> but if we could do that, achieve self-sufficiency. But pragmatically speaking, I think that's part of the chasm that makes us stop short of actually having the, the spine to pull the trigger versus to actually see that we can we can do this very differently by focusing on making sure that we're decoupling from China without conflating that to saying that everything has to instantly be onshored here in the US. You follow what I'm saying? Yes. Oh great minds think alike because that was going to be my next point, Vivek. Good, good. I'm is, glad. Yeah, you don't have to bring everything on China. I mean, we obviously want to see American manufacturing restored and booming, but you don't have to bring everything from China onshore to the United States. There are all kinds of opportunities around the world, as you just laid out. And I do think we're we're having a real missed opportunity in improving our relationship with India. You raised India, Philippines, South Korea. Korea. We have positive, constructive relationships with those countries, but India in particular as a counterweight against growing Chinese power, I think that that's been a missed opportunity for the last several uh, administrations. They might talk a good game on it, but then there's no follow through. When I was at the Treasury Department, we did take a trip to the Middle East and then went on to India. We had a couple of days in India and you really have to see India to believe what's going on there, just like China. China as well. Um, You know, I went to China with President Nixon on his last trip in, I think it was 1993, and then hadn't been back until I went uh, with Secretary Mnuchin in the Trump administration. And I could not believe what I saw. You know, in the space of one generation, the CCP turned China around from a true backwater, an agricultural society to a full 21st century uh, tech, you know, and, and industrial behemoth um, in the blink of an eye, really. I think if we're serious about moving away from China, India offers a providential opportunity, but so do the other countries that you laid out. And how, how do you think, I mean, let's, this is a whole rabbit hole unto itself. I, I do think that the relationship of trust from both sides, from India's side and the US's side, I think there's a lot of room for improvement there, but it's such a it's and this might lead to a good bridge to Taiwan. Actually, is is such a missed opportunity because, you know, as you play see the war game scenarios playing out in the South China Sea, a lot of those don't look great for us, even in a, in the case of a South China Sea Taiwan conflict. But that calculus and this is you know deep geopolitics here shifts dramatically if the Indian Ocean is closed to China, which because that's where they get a lot of their oil supplies from the Middle East, and and you know that that's a that's a scenario none of us hopes we're ever in, but you have to play it out against the backstop of the possibilities. But both economically in terms of redundancies assumed in the supply chain, as well as even geopolitically, even in God forbid conflict scenarios, that seems like a, uh, it does seem like a missed opportunity since you said you, you know, did have your experiences both Nixon and under Trump and Mnuchin. What's your number one insight in terms of what we could be doing better in that relationship and and what India could be doing better to be able to advance both nations' interests. 
Look, I think in terms of economic relationship, I think diplomatic relationship, I think political relationship and cultural exchanges, all of these things need to be ramped up big time with India. Because again, you've got this bandwagoning effect where the perception of the United States right now is that we are weak. It wasn't true under President Trump, but it was for eight years really kind of under Obama and certainly now under Joe Biden. The Indians are taking a look at the United States and saying, the United States is falling apart. This is an empire in collapse. Where are we going to develop our, our, our relationships in order, not just for protection, but also as we seek um, a, a bigger seat at the table globally on the global chessboard? So we need to take far more care in our relationship with not just India, but I think the Philippines, South Korea as well, You'll probably recall, Vivek, that under President Obama, he announced a Pacific pivot, right? And he was going to focus on the Pacific, try to counterbalance growing Chinese power, improve our relationships uh, with the Indians, with the Philippines, and so on. And it just didn't materialize. Joe Biden hasn't even stated that. Um, during the Trump years, he did take a more aggressive approach toward China, but again, almost to the exclusion of some of these other countries that we are gonna need. So the dynamic now is very difficult because again, these powers are flocking to the Chinese for economic relationship, military protection and the rest. So I think we need real leadership that is gonna be focused on India as a real counterweight against China and dare I say, an improved relationship with Russia. Now I know that's a controversial thing to say, um, especially now, given the invasion of Ukraine and the raging Ukraine war. But Vivek, I think that this is something that President Trump wanted to do, which is basically a reverse Richard Nixon. Nixon. Exactly. I was just going to say it. <laughs> right. It, it's so true. He improved relations with China to counterbalance a growing Soviet threat. He wanted to do the exact opposite and improve relations with Moscow to try to counterbalance Beijing. And you know what? They destroyed Trump with and for that approach. So you're, you're dealing with like a deep state that doesn't want to see any of the things that we're laying out here today, Vivek, which is why we need strong leadership to, to not just take on our foreign threats, but the ones here at home as well. I respect that incredibly. And actually, that was a great bookending of where we began this journey in uh... You know, I think that if we find ourselves in this position today, maybe Putin will be the equivalent of the of, of Mao Zedong back then in the relative position we're in versus Xi Jinping being in the position of, of the USSR. Um, you know, I think that that's interesting to learn from that history to say that the necessity of that balance of power and being able to take a, a logical approach. Mao Zedong was never going to be a friend of the United States any more than Vladimir Putin is going to be a friend of ours today. But pragmatically, in terms of balancing our threats, how do we actually potentially, you're right, it's a controversial statement. I share your view on that, Monica. It's not controversial with me. I think it's controversial in much of our defense establishment. How do we pierce through that, You know, I would say, psychological obstacle, if not worse, it, it, cynical forces in our deep state to do it while also learning from the mistakes last time around? To say that the, whoever Putin's successor is doesn't then turn that on its head to put us back in the same place with Russia 50 years from now. I don't think history has to repeat itself in that same way if we do learn from it. But I also think we can't be dogmatic and think that this is the Russia uh, and the China of 1980 because it's not. And I think you clearly in this discussion demonstrate your understanding of that is deeper than not only most, but probably I would say most anyone I've talked to in a very long time, which I'm, which I'm incredibly grateful for. Uh, you and I will have to have a discussion on Taiwan. We, we barely, we got to the doorstep and we, we, I think set this up really well, teed up for what could probably be a full hour that we do separately on Taiwan. And so if you're open to that, we'll do that another time, but I'll give you the last word to tease that discussion and make your prediction for what do you think does happen in the next five years with respect to Taiwan? What's your perspective on what we should do about it? We'll close this episode with that and we'll pick up next time when we left off. Sure. Well, thank you again, Vivek. Um, look, when it comes to 
any of our enemies throughout history, they've always told us exactly who they are, what they believe, and what they intend to do. Whether it was Adolf Hitler, Joseph Stalin, Mao Zedong, you name it, every single one of our enemies throughout history has had a manifesto and a declared statement of purpose. So none of this is ever a mystery, but the United States, like all Western powers, are always very, very slow to see the threat. Um, in this case, unrestricted warfare, which is what the CCP identified back in the 1990s, how they were going to defeat the United States and the West, it's all right there. Again, not a mystery. And a critical part of that is regaining control over Taiwan. You want to talk supply chain, you know this better than anybody else, chips, electronics, so much of everything that we are reliant on from our cars to our refrigerators and microwave ovens, Taiwan. So we are talking about an economic linchpin that is incredibly important and significant. The CCP under uh, President Xi sees a very short window of opportunity to move on Taiwan. Just as Vladimir Putin saw a small window of opportunity under the weakness of Joe Biden to move on Ukraine, President Xi sees the same to move on Taiwan. So I would not be surprised if we didn't see a full invasion or at the very least a blockade, which is the equivalent of an invasion of Taiwan in the next year and a half to two years while Joe Biden is president. Because look, the, Joe Biden is their guy. They know there's not going to be any kind of serious retaliatory response from the United States under Joe Biden. And they see a window here, just as Putin did. And you know what? You're talking about dictators, Vivek, but they would be remiss. They would be negligent in their own duty to their own country and their own country's interests if they didn't move while there was a weak American president. Right. So I anticipate a very serious kinetic action against Taiwan in very short order. And we've got some attention on this now in the United States. But unfortunately, we do not have an administration that anybody has any confidence is going to act in a meaningful way if and when that looked imminent. A dour ending, but I think a prediction that unfortunately, Monica, I share in common with you in making. And we'll spend an hour on that in due course on a later episode of this to dive fully into what those scenarios are. This sets the perfect backdrop for that conversation. So thank you, Monica. Appreciate your time on the podcast, and we'll be talking again soon. I look forward to the next time, Vivek. Thank you so much. I'm Vivek Ramaswamy, candidate for president, and I approve this message. Paid for by Vivek 2024.